No, stop calling. I can't answer. You can answer if <laughs> you need to answer. answer. She's, she's out. I know, but it's, I don't want... It's like, it'll be about getting chamomile tea because I asked her to get chamomile tea. I think she can figure that out. It's not... It's not. This is all staying in. This is going to be part of the recording. Now. It's, all, it's, all, it's all there. Anyway, right... Oh dear, right. Hopefully she doesn't call again. She'll be fine. She'll figure out that I can't answer. Uh, so uh, Chase, you were uh, unceremoniously, one could say, removed from Acts 29. Uh, but we'll not talk so much about you leaving so much as there's been a number of churches, I believe over 50% of their churches didn't renew their membership with the organization uh, after the last year. So that was only quite recently that that came out. Do you have some thoughts on that? Have you got connections there? And Anything that you sort of feel was, um, I mean, it might have given an indication from your time there that this could have happened. Yeah, it, it's an interesting uh, reality they're facing, um, and they've kind of brought it on themselves. The uh, the number 50%, whatever number you want to say, it's anywhere between 30 to 57%. These were numbers that people that went to, they had their latest conference in Texas. Uh, they had you know, some big-name speakers there. And uh, people on the ground there, that's the number that they were reporting to people on the ground. And so those people, the, those individuals passed the information along to me. I was pretty surprised by that. And I shared that, and it caused quite a stir. They, uh, one of the challenges with any kind of network uh, or denomination is going to be tracking membership. And Acts 29 historically has not been great at tracking membership in terms of who's in and who's out. You'll go on their website and you'll see churches that have been out for six years and they're still on the website. So the website is Mm. hardly reliable in terms of data. Uh, But that's the number that that, that they were telling people at the conference that people had heard. And yeah, I think it's a, it's an indictment uh, on, on kind of the the direction uh, as we've seen over the last four years since 2020, um, various stances, whether it's alignment with black lives matter Uh, And that comes from the president, uh, Matt Chandler, uh, in the pulpit saying stuff about that, or another church planter, a church in Australia, a fairly significant church, talking about promoting transgender rights. And so in in the movement itself, and this is is a microcosm of the broader problems in many of the young Restless Reformed churches, is that they didn't do a good job of defining clearly the biblical worldview uh, they wanted to reduce the biblical worldview to justification by faith, which we would all say, excellent, good job, uh, we agree. But they failed to push that, uh, p- push the implications of that to all of life. And so there was a, there was kind of a hedging against. They tried to create kind of a safe space for many people to disagree on what they perceive to be peripheral matters. Turns out they're not peripheral matters. Uh, and the Christian history and church tradition and our creeds and our confessions say a lot about matters that people are facing today. And so uh, rather, than, rather than taking the kind of courageous way forward and saying, this is who we are, this is what we're going to be about, it was always kind of couched in very, uh, what now seems like seeker-sensitive language in terms of, you know, how we're going to represent ourselves. And um, and I think for many of the pastors who, who might have left, whatever number that may be, because they, they will probably never come out and say it because it would, it would be pretty detrimental to the, their reputation. Um, you know, one of the clauses they put in there for the renewal process was that you're not allowed to publicly disagree with any stated position of Acts 29. And that was fairly alarming to many pastors as it would be to most pastors. I talked to pastors in various denominations, whether it's Presbyterian, Baptist, whatever it may be. And that's a, that's an odd, odd tactic, uh, an odd thing to sign your name to as a pastor that I'm not going to disagree with this organization that I'm part of. And so, uh, so yeah, I think they're, they're a great little canary in the coal mine. They're not a big network, but they've had a massive impact in the evangelical landscape. They're connected deeply with Gospel Coalition and other such organizations. And so, um, so yeah, I think it's it's more of a reflection of that whole movement kind of um, just getting captured and not really having a vision for Christ being for all of life, for the Word of God being pushed fully, um, and even a, a permissiveness for different tactics uh, being deployed. And so, yeah, it's it's been interesting, and we'll see see what happens. But you know, I have some some good friends. Uh, most of my good friends have left the network. Um, if they're still in the network, that would be surprising to hear. But uh, but yeah, that's kind of what's going on. Yeah, I think it's very interesting from our perspective. You know, I, I'm not not part of it, and you obviously not 
not part of it anymore. But I think one of the things that we've talked about before is that there are, I think there are a lot of churches that are waking up and they're looking for direction. And I think they're also recognizing where that direction is not coming from. Um, and, and so I suppose that's one of the things we're aiming to do uh, clear truth, um, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth as as to what excites you about what we're doing, but but it's one of the things that excites me about it anyway. You're going to be involved, you're going to contribute for us uh, and help and uh, give some thoughts uh, on the overall strategy as well, which is wonderful. Um, tell us what sort of excites you about it and why you want to be involved. Yeah, there seems to be a huge need today for pastors and lay people uh, and Christian churches to be equipped on how to engage the issues in their everyday life from a theological and biblical perspective. And I don't believe that that is necessarily uh, that one denomination or one thinker has the kind of like market on that right now. In fact, many of the legacy institutions like Christianity Today and, um, you know, like I mentioned, the Gospel Coalition, they become kind of bywords amongst many of God's people. And so there's a huge need today for better equipping, um, you know, and, and Clear Truth Media is just one of many uh, things that needs to happen in terms of uh, equipping the church today as far as a, kind of a parachurch type approach to helping God's people think biblically about various matters facing us in the church. And so there's a, there's a, 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 a lack in, in the landscape of like when somebody in my church comes to me and goes, well, how should we think about this matter or what should we think on this particular issue? There doesn't seem to be a lot of resourcement or equipping for God's people for me to go where I used to go like, oh, the, I'm sure the Gospel Coalition just search transgenderism on the Gospel Coalition. I'm sure right. something good will pop up and that's not there. And so how can we better equip God's people to think biblically and applying that to all of life? I think the idea that we can kind of live in this uh, you know, sequestered, neutral space where, you know, it's just a marketplace of ideas, let the best idea win. Well, that's not reality right now. For many Christians, they feel uh, oppressed and persecuted for their faith and ostracized if they publicly represent their faith in any, any way at all. And so helping to provide a courageous voice that says, you're not crazy. This is what God's Word has always said. This is what the church has always taught. And here's, here's different ways you can engage in these conversations, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in the workplace or here's, here's things you should be looking for in society that the, this is part of the, the kind of long march through the institutions of cultural Marxism. And so I think all of these provide uh, the necessity for a new thing to come. And uh, like I said, clear truth is one uh, that I hope of many. And I would even look to people in, uh, in like Moscow, Idaho with, uh, with yeah. Doug Wilson and Cannon Press. They do great work up there. Um, what's, what's, what I think clear truth, what a distinguishing mark and opportunity it has is with somebody like my dad, and when I send him a when I send him an article from from uh, Doug Wilson, it, it pretty much goes over his head. You know, it's not it's not because my dad is not smart or anything like that. It's just not speaking the the, the language of the common man sometimes. Um, and I think Clear Truth has a unique opportunity to to provide a media outlet, to provide podcasts and articles. They're going to speak to everyday Christians in in a concise form that equips them to love God more deeply and worship Him more faithfully in all of life, not just on Sunday mornings. Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. No, totally agree. I think that's what we want to do. And so delighted that you're part of it and getting to do it together, together with you is going to be a ton of fun. So thank you.